Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton, and this special Pride Month episode, I speak with Josh Boucher, the North Dakota House Minority Leader and first openly gay person to be elected to the legislature in that state. We talked about his experience running for office and his work to make North Dakota more inclusive, as well as how people often forget that North Dakota was not always ruby red and how and why the politics of his state have evolved over time. We also talked about his efforts to use a massive state surplus to invest in North Dakotans, including addressing the health, the benefits cliff, and getting more people on the path to upward mobility, just like he saw happen with his own parents. I loved a point he makes about the problem of legislating in black and white for a gray world, and hearing about his passion for making government more flexible and effective. Enjoy. All right, Josh Boucher, welcome to an honorable profession. Wonderful. Good to be here, Debbie. So excited to talk to you. I was just saying as we were coming on air here that you are our very first North Dakota New Deal leader. So that's so fun. And I'm so happy that you're part of our organization. And I'm excited to talk to you about North Dakota and all the stuff that's going on where you live. But I wanted to maybe start with the fact that we are talking in Pride Month. And you, when you ran for office for the first time in 2012, were running to be the first openly gay candidate ever elected to the legislature, as I understand it. And I'm just kind of wondering how that experience was for you and whether that's changed over the time that you've been in office. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be a New Dealer and to just learn that, you know, I'm our first North Dakotan is a, an even greater honor. So I hope to wear the badge well and, and work well with my other New Dealers. I'm really looking forward to the networking and the opportunity that comes from it. Yeah, I've, I've grown up my whole life in North Dakota. I'm, I turned 40 years old this year. And so it's been a big turning point for me. And so I've served in office now going 10 years running for my reelection due to redistricting. We're in the middle of my cycle, but I have to run again. So yeah, when I first ran in 2012, I was running and, and had I been elected or running as the first openly gay legislator to the state legislature, you know, it was a great experience. I had been out for a number of years in my community here in Fargo and and statewide, I had been recognized for some of the social justice work that I had done around LGBT equality. Specifically in 2009, we introduced a statewide fully inclusive non-discrimination policy at the state level. It did not pass. But at that time, what we didn't realize until later was we were actually the first state to pass a fully inclusive non-discrimination policy out of a chamber in its first attempt. So Certainly a little bit of progress was made there. But running in 2012, you know, I think we were at a different time in our nation. We were at a point where 10 years before in state, well, I guess we've been eight years before in a state like North Dakota, we had a ballot initiative to have a constitutional amendment to define marriages between one man and one woman. And then to be eight years later running for a state legislative seat, but also a lot of notoriety around my sexual orientation and the issues that I would be bringing to the table. It was it was an honor, and and I was pleased to be able to be elected. Ran in a district that had been held by at that time Republicans for well over twenty years, but coming out of the Obama campaign world in two thousand eight, I learned how to organize and how to talk to voters and get to know them, and became the top vote getter in a four way race, and was sent to Bismarck. And you know when I showed up in the Capitol, a lot of my colleagues didn't. Either that knew that I was an openly gay individual, and I also had many colleagues who had no clue. Kind of showed me the breadth of what type of news people pay attention to or what they're in tune with as part of the election. And and I've had a great experience since. My colleagues, regardless of political affiliation or what side of the ideology aisle they're on, have been very respectful of me. Not necessarily to LGBT North Dakotans in more recent years as we look at policies, and I can discuss some of those things, but I think it's important to have 
people like me, people of diverse backgrounds, whether that's their race, their religion, their gender, their education background at the table so they can talk about their experiences and make sure we're passing good policy and ever more so that we're seeing now standing up against bad policies as well. Yeah, that's so great. And let's let's talk a little about the policy. I, I think if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me, that the non-discrimination, statewide non-discrimination act you passed out of the house still is not law in North Dakota, if I am right, but that there's been some movement maybe with some of the younger legislators, even from the other side of the aisle. Like what's that journey of that specific policy? And then how else are you thinking about, I know it's been something that you've been advocating for, how else are you thinking about trying to help make North Dakota um, kind of a more inclusive state generally? Yeah, yeah, good questions. Actually, in in 2009, when we introduced it, we started in the Senate and, and there's 47 senators and it passed out I want to say with 24 votes. And at that time, there was a little bit more of uh, equity between Republicans and Democrats in the state, uh, at least in the state Senate and the state House. And we actually had as many Republicans vote for it in 2009 as we had Democrats vote against it. And so it opened our eyes to a conversation. And and again, as our state, it wasn't the partisan conversation that it's evolved to and that it was in many other states. So we were fortunate because we were able to have Republican colleagues who were able to talk about it from their viewpoint and ideology. And for many of them, it was because they had a family member or someone close to them who shared personal experiences about the impacts of this legislation or the impacts of lacking having protections around employment and housing as it relates to sexual orientation and gender identity. And then an opportunity for us to talk to our Democrats about why it's important that we as a party are standing up to be fully inclusive to make sure that everyone in North Dakota can be here and call North Dakota home and a place to work and a place to go to school. We introduced the bill a number of times. Our legislature meets every other year and we only meet for 80 days. So extremely part-time. And so that gives us some opportunity to be back home, to talk to folks, to try to organize better. And actually, our evolution has been of one in which we actually continue to lose votes. It has gotten to a point where we actually did not introduce the policy in 2021 because of the work hadn't been done that needed to be to shore up. And we had actually lost a large number of our Republican colleagues who had supported it, both out of retirement, but also it was being used against them in their own primary races. And And in the 2021 legislative session was the first time, and I say it's fortunate, even though it was unfortunate it happened, but fortunately it was the first time we've had to fight bad policy proposals focused on the LGBT community in the state legislature. And that had to do with trans youth involvement in sports. We were able, it unfortunately passed the House and the Senate. Our Republican governor, Governor Doug Burgum, actually vetoed it and we were able to sustain his veto in the state Senate. So that is not law in North Dakota, but we just wrapped up our primary, you know, as we record today, our primary was yesterday here in North Dakota. And unfortunately, based on the makeup of who's coming out of those primaries, if that bill is reintroduced, it won't have the same outcome it did last time. That's terrible. That's interesting. I, I don't know that I realized the governor vetoed it. Why did he veto it? Just That might surprise people. Yeah, no, uh, Governor Burgum tends to be very open-minded. He actually comes out of the tech space. He was an executive within Microsoft. So our chambers of commerce got involved with our tourism industry on top of our education system and, and advocates and talked about that this is before the pandemic or as we're in the middle of the pandemic, I guess I should say, and the fact that we knew we were having workforce challenges and we already have an image issue with North Dakota being cold with the weather. We can't change the weather but we can change how we treat people and make sure that we are a place that's welcoming and a place where people want to visit and come and live and start families, regardless of what their family looks like or is made up of. And, you know, that was great. We had our chamber of commerce along with some prominent employers, uh, specifically the sports tourism industry, which is big in places like Fargo and Bismarck. I mean, we host large national for 20 years, USA wrestling competitions in Fargo, swim meets from around the region come to North Dakota because we've invested in facilities, our local park boards and school districts. And those were some of the first organizations that they have their own policy related to who can compete in what categories. And our state superseding that would limit their ability to come and host events here. And that has a huge financial impact, not just to business owners and the people who host those communities, but a huge economic impact on the perception of who we are as a state. 
And so our governor really believed that, and, and that's his reason for vetoing it. Our high school activities association already has a sound policy that is rooted in science and the best practices of, of uh, sports professionals and coaches. In all honesty, when these situations have come up where there's been a youth who identifies as trans or is transitioning in the middle of their program, it's been handled at the local level. The school districts have found a way to make it work, whether it's how to use facilities, how to allow people to compete. These red herrings that are thrown out by the opposition of people losing scholarships and taking up space for other people, and now this is an infringement on Title IX, is nothing from the, the truth, especially at a time where we're working with young people who are trying to find their place in the world, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, and what better opportunity to build relationships and figure out how to problem solve than youth athletics or theater or drama or the Science Olympiad Club. We should be encouraging students to participate, not discouraging them. You know, I'm so glad that you answered that question because so many of the issues that you're dealing with as a legislator, as so many of your colleagues around the country are, are I mean, are all red herrings, right? The, the answer I just heard you say is there's a system for this. We should not be legislating this at the state level. This is trying to make a political point, right? Probably as much as anything else. This is not real sound, thoughtful public policy. Is that a fair description And uh, in your mind? And it's just frustrating that that's kind of what we're dealing with here is like, we're not trying to really solve issues that I want to talk to you about in a minute about how we help the, your fellow citizens with economic issues and their bread and butter issues. These are issues that are, you know, really just trying to stir up division and controversy, don't you think? Absolutely. It's all about elections, right? It's all about getting someone across the finish line, regardless of what they'll accomplish while they're there on behalf of their neighbors, their constituents. And I think the challenge, you know, I struggle with the hypocrisy that we often see in policymaking and politics around, you know, a state like North Dakota, who is regardless of the administration, Democrat or Republican at the federal level, or even at our local level, fighting with the federal government and and what we see is overreach, whether it's in agriculture or it's in energy or it's economic development, we're pretty independent people. We want to set our own paths. And sometimes the government, federal government infringes on that. So then for the state government to find the solution around local issues and say, we're going to infringe on that, the complete hypocrisy. I mean, the number of resolutions we pass out of our chamber telling the federal government what they should or shouldn't be telling us what to do. And then we go back to our cities and our school districts, and we try to tell them what to do because we lack the understanding of what works in Fargo may not work in Watford City. And the the successes of rugby may be different than the successes in Castleton. And we should allow flexibility and innovation and allow everyone to try new ways to make government work at whichever level you're at. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I do want to talk about you and you kind of mentioned the the transition that North Dakota has undergone in terms of the political makeup. I'm sitting here in California, as we were talking about, I think that most people think about North Dakota as this ruby red, always been state. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, you had two Democratic senators not that long ago, right? Heidi Heitkamp and Conrad and Dorgan. And you were mentioning the transition in terms of the number of legislators that you've had the minority that you now find yourself in leadership in with so few of you on the Democratic side of the aisle. So what do you attribute kind of this shift to over the last, like, say, you know, 10, 20 years? Yeah. In North Dakota, we have, again, I'll go back to we're a fairly independent state. And so even at a time when a Republican governor was elected in 1990 and we started seeing the shift as far as the statewide and local elections, we still had a congressional delegation made up of Democrats all the way through 2012. And then Senator Heitkamp ran, was able to win and serve a term, and then unfortunately wasn't reelected in 2018. And I attribute that to, you know, for a while we were independent. We didn't worry about what was happening in Congress or the, the problems they were dealing with or the political infighting. We still found ways to make things work. I think that's still true, even as we become more conservative. Our social conservatism that is coming in is coming in because of outside influence. We have been a a state, and I think most people would be interested in reading about the history of the Democratic Nonpartisan League. I'm actually a member of the Democratic NPL, not the Democratic Party. And similar to our friends in Minnesota, who are the Democratic DFL, the uh, Democratic Farmer Laborers League, it's about bringing together coalitions. And the Democratic NPL in the early 1900s was uh, split from the Republican Party. They built a coalition. They overtook the government, invested in the, you know, to stand up against Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis-based grain elevators and the railroad companies who were taking advantage of our family farmers and our economies. We built our own state bank. 
We built our own state grain mill, and both of whom are major economic or or revenue generators for our state. I mean, I think I just saw the press release last week that the Bank of North Dakota has generated $140 million of revenue that goes to be used for further economic development, student loan assistance, housing, farmer loans. The state grain and elevator, which produces some of the best uh, flour for baking around the country, you know, anywhere from 13 to $20 million they put back in the general fund to help us invest in North Dakota first. And, and so that's been a part of our legacy. And, and, you know, we're fortunate, even with the growing conservatism, I, I might be giving my Republican colleagues too much credit, but one thing I ask them to pay attention to as we come out of these primaries and we elect more conservative, ultra-conservative legislators is that those moderates that are reelected don't forget that we are a Republican state that invested in Medicaid expansion. And we were one of the first to do that with a Republican governor prior to Governor Burgum. And because of that, we've kept rural hospitals closed. We have not had a hospital closed in our state like many other rural states have. We have invested anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of our state per pupil payment covers the cost of K-12 education. We have continued to invest in behavioral health, especially as it gets challenging with workforce and being a very rural state to make sure that services and delivery of services is available to everybody. These are things that were built because, you know, even though the Democrats, we have been in a super minority for a while now, we've always been a part of the ruling coalition with our Republican colleagues talking about common sense issues that are important to North Dakotans. And that's my fear as these national red herrings continue and these social conversations that really have little impact for anyone other than harming people is going to continue to drive away good policymakers and people who really want to invest in their communities, regardless of political party. Yeah. I want to talk about a little bit in terms of the what I understand is kind of a split in the Republican Party in the state, right? There's these Bosti- the Bastiat caucus. Feels to me again from afar that there's this is a little like some of what's happening at the national level that there are some you know we're in the middle of also watching of course the hearings right now and January sixth uh, committee hearings it feels like there are you know what you might call a reasonable Republican caucus and then there's a crazy you know the you know just kind of an extreme right that's really out of t- not trying to drive policy that really is going to impact and help people. And so maybe you can tell people a little bit about what that caucus is in North Dakota and how that's playing out in terms of both within the Republican Party, but in, in your state and how you're working with across, you know, across the aisle as you can. Yeah. So in North Dakota, I was elected in 2012. And at the same time, one of my colleagues, uh, Representative Rick Becker from the Bismarck area was elected and he was a principled libertarian at that time. And so the Bastiat caucus has a very much did have a libertarian lean to it, but it kind of became a home for the antagonist Republicans, the people who were fed up and saying that the current Republicans or the establishment, quote unquote, Republicans weren't conservative enough. And that then folded into what we saw with President Trump and this, you know, kind of Trumpism within the Republican Party of really just being against everything. And that's the challenge is that we don't know what these people are for anymore. We just know that they like to say no a lot. And that means investing in our communities. You know, North Dakota is rich in energy resources and a true all the above. You know, I think a lot of people want to slam us for our oil industry and our our long history of coal. But we have some of the quote unquote cleanest coal in the country because we had a Democratic governor who said, if you're going to take coal, you're going to reclaim the land. And so anyone who will drive through North Dakota, the only way you'll know that there's a coal mine is you'll see the smokestack. The land is completely reclaimed and that's part of our policy. Now, we weren't able to do that with the oil industry. That happened. That development happened too quickly. But we have also a lot of hydro. We have solar. We have wind. So we truly are about all the above. So that generates great resources for our state, for our school districts. But these individuals will just say no to in those investments because no is what's popular to them. You know, unfortunately, we've seen in, in our state, at least, and I think we're seeing it as we look at the January 6th hearings and, and, and others, that these folks also aren't serious in understanding how the law works. We have had a number of ballot initiatives. North Dakota, again, because of our history of the Nonpartisan League, has really good, accessible access to the ballot. So North Dakotans with a few thousand, about 14,000 signatures, can get an issue on the ballot statewide or even at the local level. And the Bastiat Caucus has attempted that. Well, there are two attempts, both at the local level and the Fargo School Board recall, and then for the state to put term limits on legislators, failed because almost half of their signatures were false. Someone went and just 
they sort of took a phone book and filled out names, or they allowed people who weren't North Dakotans to fill out the form. They just found people who were excited and about the idea with them. And, and so not taking the process serious, which then makes it a threat to the rest of us, because now other people are going to come and say, see, we don't want people taking advantage of our constitution. So we should change the process, make it harder for North Dakotans to hold legislators or the governor accountable. So it is a dangerous, not only in their policies they're introducing, but also their, their impacts to democracy and, and the values that North Dakotans have had in terms of our direct democracy, specifically in holding policymakers accountable. Yeah, but it sounds like they're not gaining as much traction as one might fear in terms of some of the candidates they've been running. Is that is that right in recent even? Well, it's it's been hit and miss. You know, they for they're holding about even. Um, right now, I think they've lost some of their leadership. But you know, Senator Hoven, who has been elected, uh, he was governor for a long time. He's been our U.S. senator for a long time. Usually, he gets seventy some percent of the vote, which means a lot of Democrats are voting for him too. But he. He barely eked out his convention. They had the largest turnout of the Republican convention a couple months ago, and he won by about 190 votes to, to a Bastiat challenger. This representative, Rick Becker, who I talked about, challenged him. So, and, and just coming out of the primary the other night, yeah, it's mixed bag in terms of, of who will be coming. And a lot of these folks lived in the House, uh, and now many of them have made it to the Senate. So the Senate, which we depended on to kind of save us from ourselves at times, is getting a little bit more Trumpy, for the lack of a better word. Interesting. interesting. I, I want to talk about some of go back to what you were saying about kind of just saying no and the importance of just governing responsibly and trying to help people. I know you gave a speech recently, I think, at your state party convention talking about kind of this unique opportunity you have in North Dakota, like in so many parts of the country where you've got some budget surpluses, you've got federal money to you through uh, the American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure deal and other things. And you talked about the need for investment in North Dakotans. And that kind of making sure that, you know, urging your fellow legislators to take this moment and not this opportunity to make those investments. Tell us about the opportunity and what specific kind of investments you'd like to see. First and foremost, our economy continues to be stronger than expected coming out of the pandemic. And I think a lot of people, a lot of states were seeing that. And we have to give credit where credit's due. And that came out of Congress and the influx of resources to help supplement local government and state government uh, at a time where we didn't know what was going to happen. North Dakotans received checks from the government. Businesses got basically giant grants to make sure they kept people on payroll. All those things helped a state like North Dakota keep the economy growing. And we're seeing that in our state coffers and our city coffers and whatnot. And so that, I think, gives us an opportunity on top of we're seeing, again, record high oil prices, which, uh, as most folks don't understand, we as North Dakotans put on the ballot that the first 30% of oil taxes goes directly into what we call the legacy fund, which is about to break $10 billion in assets, which we use the interest then to help do some investments and programs. Now, my Republican colleagues have been using that to backfill the budget so they can give tax cuts over the last few years. But this is supposed to be an opportunity we could potentially fully fund the cost of K-12 education across the state. We could have universal health care in the state of North Dakota funded by the Legacy Fund. We could build roads and replace roads without support from the federal government if we really wanted to. I've been looking at our surplus that's coming in and in the big idea that I have, and I've been visiting with many of our new dealers about, is folks are maybe familiar with what's called the fiscal cliff or the benefits cliff. So there are North Dakotans who, for a variety of reasons, access government assistance, whether it's SNAP and food stamps, heating assistance or cooling assistance, child care assistance specifically, a variety of these federal programs. And unfortunately, what happens is an individual who's working, uh, let's say a working mom, and we hear this a lot in the hospitality and retail industry where they have a great worker and it's, well, I'll use a, a mom again, a working mom as an example, but she won't pick up extra shifts or she won't even take a promotion to manager. She's such a great worker that her employer wants to, but she's so fearful because if she takes that salary raise or makes a few dollars more a month than she was before, her benefits get cut off, which means her kids don't have access to the childcare she needs so she can go to work or being able to pay down her student debt because she's got heating and cooling assistance to help make sure that the home is comfortable and safe for everybody. So I'm proposing that we take some of this one-time money and some of this legacy fund money that we can count on as an investment over time and get innovative. Let's figure out what is the North Dakota solution so that we can increase workforce participation, help people get more sustainable economically in their households, and then have less people needing government assistance. 
we saw through the pandemic how many people were able to take the risk that they didn't take before of moving jobs. Well, folks who are on government assistance, often we hear say that's a scarier opportunity because again, literally that check, that assistance each month is a lifeline. So I look at it as, is it a six month off ramp? Is it a nine month off ramp that we use state dollars to help offset the costs that they may lose from the federal benefit because we can't change the federal policy at the state level and then help people work more, make more, take promotions in their jobs, build healthier families, more stability economically, and and use our one-time resources and our ongoing resources through the Legacy Fund to do that. And it really gets me excited. I'm a Head Start kid. I didn't know what that meant other than I went to Head Start. (laughs) And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized it's because my family income qualified. My parents were young, working family. I had an older brother who was born with a disability. So I'm the middle child and me and my younger brother were able to access Head Start. I think it's what gave us the the foundation to be good in school and do well there. I know that my mom accessed federal loans. I access federal loans. I know we were on WIC for a while. So these programs are there to help support families. And now I look at my family and my parents are upper middle class. You know, they were able to work up and out of that. They're hardworking people. My mom's a nurse. My dad's a construction laborer. They're like most North Dakotans who want to go to work. They find value in their work. And so let's reward that and let's help people do better at their work by supporting them in the short term. In the long term, we may not need them to be on some of these government assistance programs. Or we can get creative and access government assistance or create government assistance that works for the modern family. We are talking everywhere universally about childcare. And it's not just about accessing childcare so other people go to work. It's how do we support the workforce in childcare and in long-term care and in independent living. I mean, this entire care economy of a workforce that we need to support because it may not be a business model that's profitable. So it needs to be something the government helps provide support. In. Yeah, that's so smart. And I'm so excited about how excited you are about it. I'm excited about it too. I feel like the conversation sometimes, doesn't it, you know, revolve around this kind of like it, it, what you're saying is pretty nuanced. It's smart and it's nuanced and it's right. And you get into these kind of political fights about benefits or whatever it is that are all or nothing, black or white, right? And people don't understand that, you know, that like, I remember thinking back to the whole conversation during the pandemic about, you know, why people were going back to work because they could make more staying, staying home. That was such a mischaracterization, right, of what was happening. What you've said is what's happening, right, in some ways, which is how do we or what needs to happen? How do we help people who... I mean, everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to contribute. Everyone wants to feel they're part of something and that they have that kind of meaning. And so, uh, and they want to support their families the best they can, but they need that a little bit of assistance, but to to structure these programs in a way that aren't that kind of on-ramp, off-ramp, as you were talking about, that's just is a missed opportunity because, you know, you, you want to give people more shifts. You want to give people, you know, that raise that's not going to make up for everything they were making, but will give them that step up over time to get to where your parents landed. And it's just, I love your story. And I love that you're thinking about how to help that and make that true for other people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of my biggest ahas, and I, anytime I publicly speak, I talk about how policymaking is we make black and white laws for a gray world. And nothing is truer than in government assistance, where a family or an individual fills out a form, it gets processed by somebody who then now it all gets automated too, right? So there might not even be another human that touches this paperwork and then their benefit gets cut off. They might get a notice or an email or something that says you're going to be cut off. I don't know, but we don't do that when we do economic assistance for businesses. We have coaches and we have people, we have created a whole infrastructure of people to help businesses navigate that system. You know, I think within social services, we depend specifically on the nonprofit sector to help do the coaching. I was really taken aback when I went right after I was first elected and visited Cass County Social Services, which Cass County is where Fargo is in North Dakota. It's got the largest FT count of caseworkers as well as the caseload because of our population of the state. But I realized that these folks were there just to process paperwork. There wasn't someone that a family would sit down with who would say, what are your goals? How can we help you? Okay, this is a program that we can help you with for six months, nine months, however long the program will fund them for. But in the meantime, is it more schooling you want? Is it job skills that you'd like? Is it you're in a multi-generational family household? How can we make sure that your your elderly parents have the health care they need? Someone who's really looking at the family and the individual holistically. And I think we would see that we'd have healthier families, we'd have healthier communities if we invested that way, worried and less worried about someone who got $100 at their birthday party that they did or did not report 
because of their fear of losing their heating assistance. Absolutely. And I mean, we could talk about this forever because I get super excited like you about trying to make government work better. But to your point about not always being able to talk to a human, right? I was really struck by a story I learned recently about something that happened over the pandemic in Louisville, Kentucky, where, you know, at one point during the pandemic, like something like 10% of people were behind on their water bills. That's not a feasible scenario, right? Of not, you know, you can't not give water to 10%, you know, but there was no kind of way there's no nuance way to deal with it. There was not, the systems were not in place to be able to have people, as I understand it, not either just pay everything right now or have their water shut off. And so they went undertook a whole process where they went and found using some, I think working with some companies or some consultants and basically were able to say, okay, flexible payments. Can you, can you, you know, just a, a variety of other ways to deal with the situation, and get people on a path like you're talking about. And, you know, we're able to recoup a bunch of that money that they were never going to get otherwise and make sure that people's water could stay on. It just feels like those flexible, you use that word, and kind of service-oriented government, right, can really have a huge impact. Yeah. Well, I often remind my colleagues, we every month pay the paper bill for the vendor who provides paper to the state capital, right? They don't have to provide additional income resources and, and go through 16 steps of bureaucracy and this paperwork and, oh, you missed this, now you're declined. And But we make small businesses that provide independent service living support or Medicaid billing or childcare, all these extra processes, because the system was written by lawmakers who said that we had to protect taxpayers' investment in these programs. And sure, there's that our responsibility, but again, at the same time, there's fraud everywhere. So let's focus on the real fraud, not the potential fraud, and let people continue to live their lives and be successful. We know that there are barriers to accessing these programs that would help lift families out of poverty if they could access them on the short time. But when you have to fill out a 20 page application three different times for four different programs, you're focused on making sure your kids are healthy and you're getting to school and, and you're getting to your three jobs. And yeah, we can work smarter, we can work better. And we do that by listening to these families and their understanding of what their needs are. And then we get out of the way. I just want to ask one follow-up, which is, are you optimistic about the chances of being able to do something like this, getting something like this through the legislature? I Optimistic wouldn't be the word I'd use, but, you know, I serve in, as the House Minority Leader, I serve on a, a number of budget committees. And actually next week will be, I presented the idea a couple years ago. I presented it again a couple weeks ago uh, and bringing more of a formal plan. You know, I'm kind of caught up in the middle of, I have to prove it now to all my colleagues. And so we've been working with employers. Again, like I said, the hospitality industry has talked about this for years. So it doesn't have to come from me. Let's. This is an employment conversation now. This is about how do we make sure we get more workers working more in, in switching that narrative of it's not that people don't want to work. Again, that was strong through North Dakota as there was increased government assistance specifically from Job Service ND. But we're again back at some of our lowest unemployment rate in the state like we were pre-pandemic. Everyone who can work is working. And so how do we get either more out of folks or help people get into the industries we need, like teachers and nurses and childcare workers, and we can tie some programs around that. Yeah. Before I let you go, I do want to ask you about your path into public service. This is a, a big focus of an honorable profession is, you know, just making sure people kind of understand the different journeys, the very many different journeys that kind of bring people into public service and to help people as they already will from listening to you understand how you know passionate and important the work, how passionate you are about the work and how important the work you are doing. But so, you know, you mentioned early on in our conversation that you were an Obama organizer back, I think, in 08. So did you always want to, did you know you would run for office someday or was that, that the goal or how did, how did this come about for you? Yeah, no, it's a fun story to tell. So I've always been a hyper engaged, always involved in student government or key club in high school. And then in college, I was involved in my fraternity and an RA and an orientation leader and in student government. So I've, I've always been involved. And so I worked in higher education at North Dakota State University after I graduated. And so got involved in student activity, leadership development and working with students that way. But that's when I was introduced to social justice. My religious background is in the Catholic faith. And so we talked about social justice from that standpoint, but then when it was talked about more about equity at the probably more academic intellectual level at a university, I was introduced to, to a variety of things. And at that time, I was also in the process of my own coming out. And so it just really resonated with me. So my work was in social justice work, both at North Dakota State University, but then also in my community. And as I came out, then use that platform to organize LGBT community, working in partnership around healthcare reform. 
So I read a book in 2008 called The Audacity of Hope by then Senator Barack Obama. And I was just you know, starstruck. I was like, who is this individual? The vision that this individual has of what we can do and how we can be as leaders in a community. So I actually basically quit my job because that was the first time a presidential campaign, uh, a Democratic presidential campaign started investing in North Dakota. And I was able to use my background in higher ed. To, I was the college organizer. So I, I had 11 institutions across the state that I would travel to and get students engaged with vote by mail. And it was a pretty cool time to be the Obama guy that came to campus because between students and faculty and staff and the energy that was going on along with the training of organizing locally, and that's where I learned my beginning of, of political change was listening to folks. It wasn't just the idea, the intellectualism around social justice anymore. It was how do we create change through policy and safer and better communities. So I fell in love with it organizing. I, I love the strategy. I love the, I need to get a hundred more votes to get my candidate elected. So where do I go find those hundred votes? So I helped people run for office after that. Friends running for the legislature, for the city, for statewide office, some won, some lost. And then in 2012, well, I guess it would have been 2011, I was asked to run myself. And I said no many times, but then someone very smart sat down and showed me the data and said, these are the number of votes we need, Josh. You know, if we can get you to go knock these doors and do what you've done for other people. So that got me excited. And so I ran. I ran with a great team. My buddy Rick Olick ran for the Senate and Bob Jansen ran for the House with me. And we worked hard. Unfortunately, I was the only one to get across the finish line. But I remember uh, about four weeks before the election. And that's when it hit me. What if I win? Like running for office is one thing. It's the ideas and it's the energy and it's the holding other people accountable. And, and I could do something different. And then it's like, oh, crap. What if I win? And then I actually have to do some of this, right? So I was fortunate to, to win and, and was able to get my feet under me uh, after my first session. And North Dakota, for especially my legislative colleagues that are listening, we have four-year terms. Our House and Senate districts are all the same. And so we run every four years. It's nice because we only serve for those 80 days, the first two years. And so the first session is just learning how to do things. And North Dakota, we're advantageous because every bill gets a vote. You don't have to sway a committee member or a committee chair or the majority or minority leader to get your bill heard. Every bill gets a vote. So in 80 days, we vote on over 900 bills in the last few sessions. There's pros and cons to that. Whole conversation just on that sentence. How interesting. <laughs> yeah. So just the time management of it. But we do it because, uh, again, we are a pretty part-time legislature. We're, we're citizen legislators. And, and that's what I love is I get to go home and spend more time at home with the people I represent. I call friends and family than I am in Bismarck and so forth. But the disservice we provide is that we meet every other year. Our economy has shifted dramatically in the last 10 years on an almost six-month cycle. So how do we respond to that? We've taken power from the executive branch and put it all in the legislative branch. So how do we be responsive to high commodity prices, low commodity prices? And what does that mean for funding education or healthcare? So we're figuring out how do we do things differently, maybe be innovative, not only in, in the private sector, but also in the public sector. And so I'm just pleased to be here at this time and look forward to, to continue to work with you, Debbie, and your, the team at, at New Deal and, and my colleagues across the country. I'm super excited for DC in November when we go to the conference. Yeah, well, I'm so happy that you came on the show. Thank you so much for being here. It was super interesting. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with your quest to help with this benefits clip issue. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that our colleagues around the country from, can learn from you on that. So thank you, Josh. It was great to talk to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Debbie. And keep up the great work. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Row Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.